Let's um, ask the congregation, if you would, please, to turn in your Bibles to Ezekiel. Oh, long time since I said that. Ezekiel chapter 22. Ezekiel 22, and I will get there myself sooner or later. I'll give you a little extra time to get there. I know it's not uh, very common for us to get to that part, but if you find Isaiah, you can find it because you just current. keep going towards Matthew. Um, Matthew. Matthew. And you'll get to uh, Jeremiah and Lamentations, and then you'll get to Ezekiel. Ezekiel 22. And today we only read one verse. Not common that we should do that. Uh, I'll tell you what, we'll read two verses just to say that we are keeping with tradition. So let's stand together, please, as we read God's Word together. Ezekiel 22, verse 30 and 31. And I sought for a man among them who should build up the wall and stand in the breach before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But I found none. Therefore, I have poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. I have returned their way upon their heads, declares the Lord God. And I would remind the congregation this morning that even though this is not coming from the gospel, and even though this is not even coming from the New Testament, and the letters are not in red, and the letters are not spoken by the Lord Jesus himself that nonetheless what we have just read is God's very word. I would ask that you would receive it as such. Let's pray together. Once again we come together today Heavenly Father to declare your word. And we have read this prophecy written thousands of years ago and we once again acknowledge that we need you we are utterly dependent upon you to help us to understand and to help us to believe and to help us to obey so I ask that you would do that and one more thing father I ask that you would give me special grace today to preach this difficult sermon. And you know why it's difficult for me to preach. And you know why I need special grace today. So I pray that you would grant it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, thank you. You may be seated. This is a, prophet, a prophecy that was written hundreds of years before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a prophecy that was given to Ezekiel the prophet about Israel. At the time, Israel was in captivity in Babylon. They were in what was called the Babylonian captivity. Um, there came a time in the history of Israel. Israel was a mighty nation under David uh, and uh, even before David in a way under Saul and under David and even under Solomon. And after, uh, that's called the United Kingdom when uh, Saul and David and Solomon reigned over uh, what's called the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom. And for many years after that, Israel 
was a prosperous and mighty nation, although it began to decline. After the death of Solomon, the kingdom of Israel was split in two, split into the southern and the northern kingdom. The northern tribes were uh, in the north and the two tribes in the south. Uh, and so Israel began to decline as a nation. And they began, began to decline morally under the leadership of wicked and cruel kings who led them in idol worship. And God began to send prophets to the southern and the northern kingdom. And the northern kingdom was particularly horrible. And God began to tell the northern tribes that he was going to send destruction and he was going to send uh, judgment. And he did just that in the kingdom of Assyria. And Assyria came and utterly obliterated what was then the northern uh, section or the northern kingdom of Israel. And after that, there remained the southern tribes, mainly in Judah. And that included the city of Jerusalem. But Judah did not learn from their northern cousins. They began to disobey the Lord. And they began to commit idolatry. And they began to commit uh, wickedness. And God began to, to, to tell them that judgment was coming to them. And they progressively ignored that judgment. And perhaps there were times of revival and times of renewal, but it was not prolific enough, and it was not deep enough, it was not wide enough, and it was not long enough. And so ultimately, God raised up Nebuchadnezzar, this great king, this leader of the great Babylonian empire. And Nebuchadnezzar and his minions rode into Israel, into Jerusalem, in a series of three great invasions and progressively took the people of Jerusalem and the people of the southern kingdom and ripped them up from their homes and from their land and brought them back to Babylon. This is where in the first invasion, Daniel was taken and um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Young men were taken. This was a, a very calculated plan. This was something that was very calculated and the Babylonians had perfected this form of invasion. They would take the brightest and the best first. They would bring them back to Babylon and they would seek to integrate them into Babylonian life and to make them Babylonian citizens. They would seek to win their hearts and their minds and transform them into Babylonians. This is why uh, Daniel and uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were told that they had to eat certain foods. And remember, they refused to eat those foods. And so that was the first invasion. And in the second invasion, uh, Jerusalem was ransacked and the king, which uh, was a wicked king, uh, was taken out of Jerusalem and brought back to Babylon. And in this uh, invasion, a young man named, a young priest, he's about 30 years old, his name was Ezekiel, was taken along with his wife. And while they, and, and they were treated fairly well in Babylon. This was Babylon's way of doing things. They, they didn't bring them back into slavery. They brought them into Babylon and they sought to make them Babylonian citizens. They gave them land to farm. And Ezekiel even had a house. He was given a house for him and his wife. And then there was a third invasion in which the Babylonians completely destroyed the temple in Jerusalem and destroyed the wall and destroyed the gates and destroyed the city entirely and burned it to the ground. And at that time, 
Ezekiel was in Babylon along with da Daniel and a man named Baruch and perhaps even uh, Jeremiah was still there at some time. It's likely that Ezekiel knew Jeremiah. It's likely that he knew Daniel. It's likely that he knew Baruch. And Daniel, uh, Ezekiel rather, his wife died in this last invasion. Uh, at the same time uh, that uh, Nebuchadnezzar invaded and destroyed Jerusalem, Ezekiel's wife died. So he lost his wife during this captivity. And the whole time Ezekiel was in Babylon, he wasn't in the city of Babylon, he was in a city called Tel Abid. And the whole time he was in this city, he was well known and people came to him for advice and counsel and people came to him and when they came to him they came they received also prophecy and there were all kinds of false prophets during this time who were prophesying that Israel was going to quickly leave Babylon and win back the country and that everything was going to be okay but we know that Jeremiah was given a different kind of prophecy, a true prophecy that said, no, actually you're going to be in captivity for a long period of time. And Ezekiel prophesied the same way. When we read here in chapter 22, verses 30 and 31, what we are reading is Ezekiel's prophecy concerning the people of Israel. This is not a prophecy concerning Jerusalem and the walls or anything like that. This is a prophecy concerning the people of Israel. Israel, in which God has told Ezekiel that, Eze that, that Israel, Ju Jer Judah, Jerusalem, all the same thing, is under the judgment of God because there are no righteous men. There are no righteous men. Now that doesn't mean that there wasn't a Jeremiah and there wasn't a Daniel and there wasn't Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and there wasn't an Ezekiel. Oh yeah, God had raised up men. What he meant was that in the population there was nobody who was willing to stand up and be obedient to God. There were no men who were willing to stand up and be obedient to God. As a matter of fact, at the same time this is going on, Jeremiah had been instructed by God not to pray for the people. Listen to this. This is Jeremiah 11, 14. God's wrath is being poured out on the people and God says to Jeremiah, do not pray for this people. Don't you lift up a cry or a prayer for them. For I will not listen when they call to me because of their disaster. What is God saying to Jeremiah? God's saying, I sent this judgment. This is my rightful wrath on the people. They would not listen when I wooed them. They would not listen when I pleaded with them. They would not listen when I warned them. And now the disaster has come and don't you pray for them. I'm not going to listen to it. What's going to happen is going to happen. And so Ezekiel says, the wall has a gap and the wickedness is pouring in. And there are no men to stand up. There's not a man who can stand up and stop it. God's people had been given over to their own sin to their own wickedness, to their own lustfulness. And one of the judgments of God, not only was the judgment of God that Nebuchadnezzar, who was a wicked man, at least at that time, and all of ne Nebuchadnezzar's generals and all of the kings that he had, had formed alliances with, they were wicked and God was using them to judge Israel, but not only were they wicked, but the people were so wicked that God said, there's nobody here to stand in the gap. Nobody to plug it. 
This is a picture of desolation. This is not a picture of a warning of judgment. This is a picture of the aftermath of judgment. After the judgment has already begun. You say, whoa, wow, man, that could be America. That has to do with America. No, it doesn't. It has nothing to do with America. Nothing, zip, zero, nada to do with America. There is no parallel between this story and America. That's not what this is about. I'm afraid it's far worse than that. If there is a parallel here, it's not between Israel and America. It is between Israel and the church. Do you understand what I'm saying? God is warning the church. Stand up and do what's right. Stand up and be what I've called you to be. And God is calling men out of the church to stand in the gap. What is... The Bible says the judgment begins in the house of God. Now, is the church going to be lost? No. Is the church going to be defeated? No. But neither was Israel. Israel was going to be uh, restored. Israel was going to be brought back, and they, they were, and the wall was rebuilt. This is not a picture of permanent judgment, of permanent desolation. This is a picture of what happens when the church or when Israel went rogue on God and the church and Israel refused to repent and this could be a picture of what the church would look like if the church went rogue and what would happen well God would stop raising up men not just preachers although that would happen that could happen. God could stop raising. There could be. That could be. There could be a, a period of time where we don't have a John MacArthur, or we don't have a Charles Spurgeon, or we don't have a John Piper, or we don't have an R.C. Sproul. There could be a period of time we don't have a Rusty Reed, or Chris Norsworthy, or Jim Drickmer. That is true. It could happen. And in that drought, the church would languish because we would have no men who would be willing and able and worthy and competent to take the Word of God and to stand before God's people. And that would be a bad, bad thing. But it would be worse than that. It could be worse than that. There could be a drought in the church where we don't have a Tracy West, an Adam Haney, a Derek Bozeman, a Rondon Bozeman, deacons, men, any of the men in this church, all of the men in this church are godly men who love the Lord. What if God said, I'm not going to give any more of those, I'm not going to raise any more of those up? What would the church look like then? What could happen? Already this is happening in various churches across the United States of America. When churches began to abandon God's Word in favor of popular social issues like egalitarianism. And that's usually where it starts. Or we bend God's Word and say that there is no essential differences between a man and a woman. And despite what God's Word says, we're going to we're just going to flaunt our disobedience to that. We're going to do what we want to do. And that's usually the opening of the door to other kinds of disobedience. And then the church says, no, not only that, but we're going to decide that homosexuals are completely fine despite what the Bible says. Listen, we live in a time where churches have caved on one issue after another. And actually the first one wasn't egalitarian. The first one was, is the Word of God the Word of God?
And churches began in the 19th century to cave on that. Look at those churches today. Look at those mainline denominations today. You can go into some, and some of those mainline denominations have some of the greatest and most beautiful and most elaborate church buildings in this country. And you can go into the major cities today, right now, into those big, beautiful buildings, and they are what? Empty. And what is going on in there is anything but the worship of the true and living God. We are in danger, friends. We're in danger as a church. I'm not talking about America. Oh, America's in plenty of danger. That's not what this sermon's about. I'm not here to preach about America. I'm here to preach to the church. You and me. Friends, listen, we are in danger if we will not turn from our sin and if we will not stand on the very principles of the Word of God, if we are not courageous enough to say this is what's right and this is what's wrong, then we are in danger of God giving us over and creating a gap and letting judgment pour into the church. That judgment could last for decades. It could last for centuries. What would that do to America? What would that do to our families? What would that do to our world? This is a very serious thing. What does this have to do with Father's Day? Well, it has to do with godly men. Because who are the ones who hold the line in the church? against false doctrine against sin who are the ones who are supposed to hold the line godly men godly men when Paul spoke to the church leaders in Ephesus he was about to go back to Jerusalem and they didn't want him to go back because they knew it would be dangerous for him to do that he was saying goodbye to them. And he gave them a warning. He said, listen, I'm warning you now. You men, you elders, have to toe the line because there will be false teachers who will come right out of your midst and they will lead the people astray. Protect the people. Stay with the Word of God. Stay with the Word of God. They didn't do that. When Jesus gave his revelation to the Apostle John on the island of Patmos, he gave one final warning to the church at Ephesus. Warning. Warning, you're in danger. Warning. Evidently, it didn't work because the church at Ephesus ceased about 30 years later and has never been again. Listen to me carefully, friends. We're in danger. And we need godly men. And listen, this is not a slap against godly women because the fact of the line is godly women have been holding the line in the absence of godly men for about 30, 40 years. How many of you went to church with your grandma when you were little? Some people did. So I, I can, you know, if we were testifying to a big crowd, we'd have lots of young men and women who said, I went to church because grandma took me to church. Or mama took me to church. Got a lot of single women in the church. Single mothers in the church. Who are holding the line, towing the line. And God bless them and praise God for them. And some of you could testify that you had a single mother who was a godly woman. All of us could testify, or many of us could testify, about the work of intercession on our behalf that godly moms and godly grandmoms and godly aunts performed in our lives. But the fact of the matter is that the responsibility is primarily on the men. 
and the only women, the, the only reason that the women have had to step into the gap is because the men would not. Why is that? What, 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 where are the men? Where have the men been? What are we doing? Well, some might say, well, the men are busy earning a living. They're busy working on their profession. Maybe that's true. It's all too often, teacher. Men all too often place too high a toll on their profession and their career and their status and making money. And they believe, as I believed uh, very much when I was a young father, to my shame, Uh, that I had to make a certain amount of money and that that was my job and once I did that everything was okay and did a lot of damage to my family I almost lost my family because of that and I can remember looking at Casey and saying what is wrong with you woman you know that I am killing myself and you're telling me that that you're not happy? And, and I thought, how selfish of her. And it was only by a miracle of grace that God's Spirit began to work in my, in, in my heart and in my mind and began to show me that my job, my primary job is not to make money. My primary job is to love my wife and to pour into my kids. And that my wife not only needs to be financially secure, she needs to be secure in the fact that I love her. And that I am with her emotionally, not just physically. So men have been guilty of that. Men have been guilty, I'm sad to say, too often of thinking that life is a game. They never grow up and the little boys of yesterday are still the little boys of today and all too often we're more interested in playing with our toys than being godly men and if we're fathers then being godly fathers that happens a lot look at the media today look at how men are portrayed in the media as buffoons Especially, where is the godly father on modern prime time television? He's not there. He's always a bumbling, stumbling, lustful, goofy, drunk buffoon. So that happens and I think that's another place where men have been and why women have had to step up so I'm here today I'm not a prophet I don't need to be Ezekiel was and I'm here today to say that I believe with all of my heart it's time for godly men to step up before it's too late and the judgment will be eventually, okay, godly men, you're not going to step up and be a godly man? Well, how about this? I'm not going to make any godly men. I'm not going to establish any godly men in the church. And maybe it would be that God would come to, I don't think he, that, he, that, he, that he necessarily would, but maybe it would be that he would tell Brother Jim and me and Chris, don't you pray for, any, for the church. The church is under judgment. I don't know. But that's what he did to Israel. So, today I want to 
issue a call in search of a godly man. And I'm not just talking about our congregation. We're such a small congregation. And we have our issues and we have our problems and we have men and women who are at various stages of sanctification. But by and large, uh, we've got a great group of folks here and I thank God for every one of y'all. I'm talking about in search of a godly man in general as far as the church is concerned. A.W. Tozer writes, wrote these words. Until self-effacing men return again to spiritual leadership, we may expect a progressive deterioration in the quality of popular Christianity year after year. Till we reach the point that we have grieved the Holy Spirit, He withdraws like the Shekinah glory from the temple. Is that right? Can that happen? Can God with, withdraw His presence? You better believe. The Bible, Jesus said, uh, issued a warning to the churches, again in the book of the Revelation, that He gave to John the Apostle. He said that it, if these churches don't turn, that their candles will go out. The Bible talks about God writing Ichabod over the door of the church. The glory of the Lord has departed. It is possible, friends, that the glory of the Lord could depart from this church. It is possible that the glory of the Lord could depart from the churches of Louisiana and the South and of the United States of America and of Western civilization in general. Already we're seeing a shift in the uh, cultural center of the church away from the West to the South. And I'm not talking about the South of the United States. I'm talking about the Southern Hemisphere. I'm talking about the, the equilateral countries like Africa or continents like Africa and South America. There is a danger that the glory of the Lord could depart. So again, I am calling for godly men. I'm looking for godly men. What are some of the characteristics of godly men? I've got a few here. We'll give those and then we'll be done for today. Number one, godly men love God. Kind of stands to reason, doesn't it? Of course, what did Jesus say? That the greatest commandment of all is that we would love God with all of our heart. Matthew 22, just let me read it to you real quick. Sorry, not Matthew 22. There is no Matthew 22. I wrote that down wrong. I don't know. I was writing quick. Let me read to you from Matthew. I'll find it in just a second. Hold on. Matthew 5. Matthew 5. Well, I'll say Matthew 5. That's not it either. Well, how about we go to Mark 12.30? Thank you, brother. There is a verse in Matthew that I was looking for, but I don't know what it is. We'll, work, we'll make Mark 12.30 work. Of course it'll work. It'll come to me in just a minute, and we'll come back to the Matthew. Matt, uh, Mark 12.30 is this, and you shall love the Lord. Well, first of all, you've got to read 29. Jesus answered the most important commandment of all is there is one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. 
And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And you get the point here just as clearly as any other text in the Bible about loving God that we are to love God with all of our heart. But this is what, how I want to apply this to men. Because, of course, that verse goes to everybody. Everybody. Every person is obligated to love God with all of their heart. But listen to me, men. What is it about a man who is divided? A man who is divided in his allegiance to God. Jesus said that a, a, a kingdom divided, a house divided against itself cannot stand. It's going to fall. It's going to collapse. And a man who has a, a division in his heart where he is loving God, sure he loves God some, but he also loves the world a little. He loves this, he loves that. This man is divided and that man is completely worthless in the kingdom of God and useless in the kingdom of God. Let me move quickly. There are a couple other verses I wanted to get to, but let me move quickly to another point, and that is that God, our godly men, love their wives. So the first one is God, godly men love God, and the second one is godly men loves their wives. Of course, I wrote this one down, right? I don't know why I couldn't write the other one down, right? Ephesians 5, 25. Ephesians 5, 25. Would you turn there? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without women and without blemish in the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies he who loves his wife loves himself for no one ever hated his own flesh but nourishes it and cherishes it just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body and therefore Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Godly men love their wives. There is a special and unique union between a husband and a wife that is sacred and it represents and illustrates the very picture of the way that Jesus loves the church. And when we love our wives as God has called us to love our wives, then we are able, first of all, to become one flesh. She is every bit as vital to me as anything that I am. We're one flesh. And not only that, but my primary concern is to see that she is all that Jesus wants her to be. My primary concern is that Casey is holy, is without blemish, so that I can present her to Jesus and say, look what you've done in my wife. That is my concern, that Casey become as much like Christ as she possibly could be. Now, ultimately, that's up to the Holy Spirit to do that, but that is my concern as well for my wife. That's my job. My job is that my wife be the best Christian that she possibly can be. Reflect the most glory that she possibly could reflect. That's my job. That's how I love Casey. So loving Casey has nothing to do with what Casey could do for me. Has nothing to do with how good looking she is. And she is good looking. That's why, I, I, you know, she caught my eye. There's no doubt about that. It's obvious. It has nothing to do with that. Loving Casey has nothing to do with the fact that she cooks good food for me. But she does. 
Loving Casey has nothing to do with the fact that she has raised my kids and done a great job in a way that I never could and often failed. <coughs> Loving Casey has nothing to do with the fact that she is the best of the best of the best of pastor's wives and she has supported me for good and through bad. Loving Casey has nothing to do with the fact that she is kind and gentle and good towards me. It had nothing to do with it. I love her because she is my own flesh and because I want her to shine for Jesus. That's all. Godly men love their wives. Godly men make godly fathers. I almost didn't write that. Because it's not always true. How do I know it's not always true? Because I haven't always been a godly father. Knowing a lot about being a father doesn't make me a good father. Knowing a lot about theology of fathers does not make me a godly father. But it is my job and it is your job, fathers, to pursue obedience. And not just obedience, but gospel obedience. And the beautiful thing about gospel obedience is that even when my obedience is lacking, Jesus Christ mediates my obedience. And makes it presentable to God the Father. So I am to obey. And godly men make godly fathers. They love their children and they discipline their children. If you don't discipline your children, you don't love your children. In the same way, if God doesn't discipline you, the book of Hebrews says He doesn't love you. We love our children, we discipline our children, we provide for our children, but we don't spoil our children. And what father is not guilty of that? A lot of us are guilty of that, inadvertently or otherwise. But we need to provide for our children in a way that we fulfill their need in a way that is best for them, that they are, they are able to learn responsibility. And most of all, it is our obligation to provide an understanding and knowledge of God to our children. It is our understanding, it is our, our, our job to bring our children to the very Word of God and to do the best that we could do to teach them about God. And it is our, our responsibility as fathers to pray for our children. No doubt about that. And it is our responsibility as godly fathers to, to, to let our children go into this world and to let them marry these meathead guys who come knocking on our doors and warning our daughters. But you see, when you pray for your children, then not only do you just get a meathead, you don't get just any meathead, you get a godly man, young man like we got. And so I'm thankful for him. I'm sure my father-in-law thought I was a tremendous meathead. Except for the fact that I did cook and barbecue for him and so he tolerated me. <laughs> Godly men love, their, they love God, they love their wives, they love uh, uh, Godly men love God, they love their wives and they make Godly fathers. You see, I haven't been a Godly father all the time. That's okay. Somebody asked me the other day, is it okay for me to begin again? Can I start over again? 
Well, I'm glad that you asked me. I'm a preacher of the gospel. My whole life is about starting over again. My whole ministry is about starting over again. My, the message of my life is that you can start over again in Christ. That is the gospel. Yeah, you can start over again. Godly men also should receive the love and support of their families. Listen, godly men should, who are fathers, godly fathers, should be loved and honored by their wives and children. Verse 33, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. And then chapter 6, children obey your parents. For this is right, honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and you may live long in the land. So we see that it is right for fathers to love their children and their wives and it is right for wives and children to love and honor and respect the fathers. Alright, i got to go faster than this. The next one is this. Godly men work. You, you know the scripture says that if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. But you need to know this. Work is not a consequence of the fall. Work is not a curse. Work is not something that is a punishment put on man. So God created Adam and Eve, put them in the garden, and what did He tell them to do? Lay around and lounge around like, you are, like you're at a, a, um, a holiday inn on vacation? No, work this garden. Till it. Work it. We are to work. Until we die. The Puritans had it right. Work is not something that is evil. It is something that is good. It is something that is pure. God works and we should work. It's good. It's right. It's honorable. It's the right thing to do. Work is not a consequence of the fall. But the, the way that we have to work is a consequence of the fall. The fact that our work is not productive and the fact that our work is so hard and the fact that the, the, the soil would no longer yield forth its fruit easily for Adam, that's a consequence of the fall. That's what the curse is. We have to work. We have to work at our job. We have to work at earning a living. We have to work at raising our kids. We have to work at loving our wives. And the consequence of the fall is that when we work hard at our jobs, we will be, have opposition. And when we work hard at loving our wives, we will have opposition, primarily from her, sometimes. That's another Mother's Day sermon, though. We'll get to that later. <laughs> and when we work at loving our children, we get opposition from them. That's what the curse is. That's what the fall is. That's what sinful flesh does. Another one is, godly men can be trusted. Godly men can be trusted. Uh, real quick, just uh, so you know this one. Proverbs 20. I didn't write it down, but I wrote the um, reference down. Proverbs 20, verse 6. Many a man proclaims his own steadfast love, but a faithful man who can find. The righteous who walks in his integrity... Blessed are his children after him. We need to be men who are faithful. Men who have integrity. Men who are well respected in the community. You cannot have integrity. You cannot be faithful if you lie. And if you cheat. And if you supplant. And if nobody can trust your word. We say we ought to, we're going to do something, we ought to do it. I mean, all of us are guilty of this. And we need to work. Uh, my grandfather worked. That was one of his things. He worked hard at having a good name. And you could go too far with that. But you cannot go far enough with that, too. Be trustworthy. I, don't, I, haven't, I didn't number these, so I don't know what number this is, but the next one is this. How about this one? Godly men cry. Now, why did I put that? 
Well, not because God didn't need to be sorry and going around bawling all the time. As a matter of fact, too much crying, guys. Can't do that. Not attractive. Why did I write godly men cry? What did I mean by this? Godly men are real. They're not fake. I said this at a funeral the other day, but I'll say it to you too. There is no such thing as the Avengers. That's make-believe. There's no such thing as Superman or Batman. That's pretend. That's make-believe. It's amazing that I even have to say that, in the, but I do in this generation because people believe this stuff like it's real. There's no such thing, and you know, you watch, if, 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 the, if Marvel or DC Comics is not your thing, or science fiction is not your thing, the other guys watch other stuff too. Like they watch the, the army stuff, and you know, the, you know, there's no such thing as, um, as Braddock, is that what his name was, you know? Uh, um, Jim knows who I'm talking about. Uh, Chuck Norris, you know? Uh, the character that he played, and uh, you know, uh, the character uh, that uh, Rambo, you know, all, it, that's make believe. Those things aren't real. Real men, godly men, are real. And real men experience real emotions and they experience difficulties and they're honest with these things. Okay, enough on that. And by the way, a real man is humble. A godly man, part of that crying part is humble. Humility. Uh, a lot of the reason why some men don't cry is not because they're not real. It is because they are stubborn and arrogant. And that's not helpful. Last one is this. Godly men serve others. Godly men serve others. Jesus said that the greatest among you will be a servant. Uh, Hebrews 6 10, again I didn't write it down but let me turn there real quick. Um, Six ten. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And the whole thing in Hebrews chapter 6 is that the people are called upon to be servants. Servant. Serving the church. Serving God. Real men serve others. Not just themselves. Not just their family. Not just their uh, own little thing. They serve others. I don't care how much money they have, and I don't care how much money they don't have. I, I mentioned this the other day to some, you know, a lot of people would love to have a lot of money, and so they could give that money out. And that is certainly a good thing, and God has certainly done that. He raised up people like J.C. Penney and other people who were multimillionaires, and those multimillionaires gave billions to serve God billions. And so God does that. I don't doubt that. And I would love uh, to sell enough insurance and to sell enough stuff to have millions of dollars that I could give. But listen to me. Listen to me carefully. If you are not a generous person when you're poor, you will not be a generous person when you're rich. <laughs> Getting money does not magically make you generous. It just makes you have more money that you can keep to yourself. Generous poor people become generous rich people. Understand that? All right. So, where is the godly man? I'm looking for him. I'm on the search. I'm looking for godly men. Is he here today? There are godly men in this room right now, and I praise God for every one of you. We're about to make one of these godly men a deacon. And that's what we do. We watch and we see if... There are some men who are called to be special servants of the church. There are some men who are called to be elders. But there are many, many more men who are just called to be godly men who stand in the gap. 
pray, please, please God, please raise up godly men in our midst before it's too late. Father, we thank you today for your word. I thank you for godly men. I thank you for the godly men in this building. I thank you for every one of them. And I believe that each and every one of them is a gift to the church and each and every one of them is such a blessing to our congregation. And I pray that you will continue to raise them up all over our country, all over the world, that you would raise up godly men. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.